everybody. Welcome to the Gym Masters Show Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Hope you guys are doing well. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Jim Masters, reporting for duty in the host chair here in the New York area in the United States. And we're bringing back a very special friend of our show, a terrific guest who was with us not that long ago when we had an extraordinary conversation. She was on the heels of an incredible concert performance coming up in New York. And guess what? She's doing the same thing again. Now, we've got her while she's traveling. She was just in Colorado, and she was snowed in <laughs> with all the feet of snow that they had in the Denver area. Now she's in Cincinnati, and then she's going to be heading to New York and St. Louis and North Carolina, and then in June for Maine in Florida. It's going to be really, really nice. We're talking about the acclaimed actress and singer, entertainer extraordinaire, the one and only Linda Pearl is joining us here on the Gym Masters Show series as a return, very special valued guest. We're so honored to have her back here. We're excited as well because she has uh, performances that are coming up and we're very excited about it coming up in New York. And take a look at this. We're gonna pop right on and show you this. This is going to be very special. She's working with Ted Firth and company. It's going to be amazing. There is your opportunity to get tickets. This, of course, happening at the incomparable Birdland. You know, Jim Caruso and the whole gang there put on so many wonderful performances and shows with iconic and terrific guests. And Linda Pearl and uh, Diva Jazz Orchestra are going to be there for Big Band Romance. It's going to be terrific. And Nicholas King, who was a guest on our show as well, and Angela Bacari, his grandmother, another fabulous singer. They were with us. He's going to be the special guest, music director, Ted Firth. And uh, Linda is going to knock it out of the park, as she always does. She also has new music out, too. This could be the start. Don't you just love that cover? It's just really like positive and, and inspired and hopeful. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome back to the Gym Masters show, the one and only Linda Pearl. Linda, welcome back to the show, my friend. It's so good to see you come to you. us from Cincinnati. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, I, that was quite an intro. Thank you very much. Oh, the uh, pleasure yeah. is all mine. It, thrilled to be with you again. Thank you, Jim. Oh, you are very, very welcome, and uh, it is truly my pleasure. You, you've been performing since you were a child, right? I mean, I, I said when we were chatting before we went uh, on the air, I, I think probably performing in your bassinet, I don't doubt. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, my folks moved, uh, my dad's crew moved us to Japan when I was I was little, and my parents were theater-centric. That was their great joy in life, to to go to the arts and also to perform themselves anyway. So it was sort of in our, in our household. And I just started working in Japan kind of as an anomaly. I was interested in theater and spoke the language and looked this way. And there was a great curiosity of, about all things having to do with the West in that era. So I started my career then there and, uh, and just sort of kept going. And, you know, what came first for you early on when you were a kid? Did you dive into theater first? Were you performing plays and singing and dancing? And, yeah. Huh? Theater. Yeah. Very, very much theater. Um, and, and that I was fortunate to be able to perform uh, in, in theater in Japan. I mean, not classical because that's only men, but um, you know, not Kabuki or no or anything, but they were doing musicals in translation. The, the King and I in Japanese, they brought an American company over. Um, from New York. Well, the kids were from New York. The adults were from from the West End. It was quite a mishmash. And anyway, I joined that production of Oliver and trained in an academy there. But also there was there was some television work and some film work uh, that I that I did. But the the focus was primarily theater. When did you realize or did people realize at first that you had this extraordinary ability to interpret uh, the lyric and do it in a way that tells a story and brings us all in on the ride with you? Yeah. And you have such a beautiful and full and rich and warm voice as well. Mm, thank you. What a kind thing to say. Well, I think because I started as an actress and then 
I mean, music was always there. I did doing musicals and I recorded somewhat in, in Japan, but being an actress, thinking of myself certainly as an actress first and then a singer, you're involved with characters and telling a story. And for the most part, what I do is, well, actually entirely what I do is Great American Songbook. And those stories for me are like one act plays. It's always a character with a point of view and a story of beginning, middle and end. So the the songs themselves in, invite you to pay attention to the lyric and and I had a great teacher. I had I I was taught by David Craig, who was Nancy Walker's husband. Mm -hmm. I'm sure any number of people that you have spoken with uh, studied under David. He's long gone now, but I mean, you'd walk into his class and it was terrifying because they were I mean, Hal Linden and and uh, Madeline Kahn and. Mm -hmm. Bernadette, I'm sure, studied with him. I mean, it's a ridiculous roster. Alexis Smith, I mean, uh, and he didn't teach you how to sing, but he would talk to you about how to phrase, what the heck do you do with your hands? Where do you place your eyeballs? Right. You know, when do you take a step? Do, do you not take a step? When do you turn upstage, left, right? So he was a he was a master technician of that and really got you to move with articulation into the body of a song and his, I hear his voice, you know, in my head, I, I hear his note, his notes constantly. Nancy Dussault studied with him. She actually became sort of a acolyte of his. And, and so she's the person that we go to when we like, what was that that David said? We go to Nancy. No, cause she remembers it all. Um, but, and many people, you know, I mean, at this stage of life, I, you look back with gratitude for so many people from her, whom you've learned variously. Who are some of the folks, especially first with theater and with music that really inspired you and maybe mentored you along the way? Maybe they realized she really is a very talented, passionate, enthusiastic person. We've got to, you know, uh, open doors for her or show her ways to break through those doors where there's some folks that, you really were moved by uh, as you were coming along your journey? Always, always. I think it was more like, oh, poor dear. She needs so much help. <laughs> let, me, let me jump in here. Um, sure. I mean, in Japan, there were, and because as you mentioned, I we're going to go back to Japan, going to go in, in April. So I've been thinking about all these, you know, experiences that I, I had there, but working um, under Toho, which is a large theatrical corporation, there were many, many people, directors, actors, and, and discipline was the thing. Their, their sense of dedication, their, their work ethic was, is extraordinary. And I would say from a different point of view, from a, a Western sensibility, it was, it was more about, uh, about hmm, being obedient, you know, not that the creative process wasn't there, but it was, but, uh, but it was, it, it was, how do you blend in? How do you, how do you, how do you mash in, into one another? It was not about creating a, a brand new expression as it was in America at the same time that that kind of work was going on in Japan. Um, you know, we each come from our own paradigms and um, being in an island culture, I think that was very much part of the development uh, of the artistic discipline. But anyway, that was my sort of foundation where it's, it's very much part of the group. Um, you s fall in line. Um, that was very much the, the philosophy, which worked magnificently for, for what they were producing. Then to come to the States and it's forget about all of that. It's like, what are you feeling? And what are you angry about? It's angry about, I'm not angry about anything. <laughs> but, you know, they shake you up at the actor's studio and, and at Neighborhood Playhouse and places I, I studied at, but I barely survived because it was so shocking. It was so antithetical to, to anything I had been taught and you know beaten into me. Um, but Ultimately, I mean, that's sort of part of the fun, isn't it? You kind of get stretched this way and pulled that way. And, and then you kind of come back to some kind of form that works for you. So those early Japanese mentors were hugely and remain um, hugely influential to me. I mean, heavens, the people that I worked with, I did two, got to do two plays with Julie Harris. I mean, those mm -hmm. just every day was a master class. Um, 
I guess this is awfully name droppy, but I got to work ever so briefly, but with Olivier, and that was <sighs> mind blowing. He was selfless. He was so, he was also very wickedly charming. I mean, it was just like, hi, how are you? What do you want? Can I, what can I do? What can I get? I mean, it was, and he was well into his dotage, but still he had this extraordinary, extraordinary presence. Oh gosh. I mean, we could spend an hour talking about people that I've learned from that I'm grateful to that I, that I admire. How about people within the family? Did you grow up with music and arts and all of that around you? Did that inspire you early on I from did. the yeah. family? Yes. I mean, being in Japan and somehow it wasn't as accessible as it then as it is now. So family did not come, come over. Therefore, people who were there became our family. It's an, I think it's an, we were in an unusually close sort of village. And, and so it remains. I just had my umpty ninth high school reunion and, and we were remarking how still valuable we are to one another and our hearts and all of that. Um, but my parents being art centric, dad's parents were both vaudevillians. My mother had been a ballerina. So they carried that passion into their marriage, into the family life. And we had a big old house and there weren't that many hotels in the sixties and early seventies in Japan. So they'd come and stay with us. So we had fancy pants visitors. I took it sort of de rigueur. Doesn't everybody do this, but you know, Harold Clerman stayed with us. Henry Mancini uh, didn't stay with us, but he would come over. The Royal Shakespeare Company, when they were on tour there, they'd come over for parties and gatherings. And it was crazy. Tennessee Williams lived with us for a couple of months. I mean, just ridiculous. Artists and sculptors and dancers, and you just never knew. And then also uh, um, vets, you know, not, not vets, but uh, active duty men during the Vietnam War, they come over for R&R &R and they'd have Christmas with us. So, you know, it was just, it was a very interesting dinner table. Uh, lots, lots going on. People from, from business and uh, missionaries and artists. And um, so it was a robust conversation. Mm. What, that's extraordinary. My God, <laughs> can't wait to read your memoir. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, really? Uh, but, but you soaked it all up and you appreciated it. And these little tidbits from all of these different people that sort of meandered in and out of the house and in your life uh, is very enriching, huh? Well, it, it was, I think you, as I said, you sort of take it for, for granted when it's going yeah. on, but, but yes, I, I mean, the weave of it, it was very, uh, was, was rich and I appreciate it now, uh, really on, on a deeper, on a deeper level. We had music was a constant in the, in the household. My parents, I think maybe because, you know, we didn't have internet or television really. So my so the turntable was in large part my parents connection as much as they loved living in asia they loved every second of it but i imagine there were they had their own nostalgic moments anyway music was a constant and so we had on the turntable broadway tunes and a lot of jazz a lot of big band sound a lot of great singers of the day um so that it was, uh, that was sort of the soundtrack, the ongoing soundtrack of, of my childhood. And it was all Americana music. So Broadway, Great American Songbook and jazz. Mm. So you soaked that all up. What, what do you think it is about, and we've had this conversation with a lot of folks who celebrate it, why people love, and, and it seems to resonate so deeply um, with the great American song book, when they hear those songs, the, the mm -hmm. feelings that they have, the connection that people have, what do you think it is about that particular material that really deeply connects with people? They almost can't get enough of. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, there's a lot to it. And the more I'm steeped in it, the more there is for me. I, th I think for one thing, it captured the, the emotional fabric of so many people's lives. I mean, what these people had come from, so many of them had escaped pogroms. They were metabolizing the kinds of travesty, travesties that we're seeing going on in the Ukraine or in, in Gaza. You know, I mean, people who's, who'd lost limbs and families and villages and lives and livelihoods and 
So, but making it through, and they were one of the ways that they were, this was mm, uh, charted was in, in music. They would pour this into their songs. You could hear those Russian strains of music with that um, Vernon Duke wrote Vladimir Dukowski, but Vernon Duke, you know, he, I mean, you hear the home country in those music. So I think there's a tremendous amount of processing of life and tremendous amount of healing that's in the music and in the lyric. And that never goes out of style. That's the human condition, you know, for whatever we're all dealing with in the world today, it's a lot. And so I think those songs are, there's, it, it, it's powerful music to, to listen to. It's not as, I mean, it was coming out of a particular era, but it, but it's universal, you know, it, it translates to, so in, in remarkably and empathically to today. When you were getting involved in the film world and television world, were you always still honing your craft in music and performance and singing? Were you doing a balancing act, doing that while taking on all these incredible roles <laughs> in television and film? Well, it's curious you'd say that. Yeah, I missed, after I'd been in LA for a while, uh, I moved to LA when I was 18, and then suddenly there was no, there was no opportunity for music, really. Um, it just didn't happen. I think I went back to Japan at some point, maybe when I was right around there to record a little bit, but I, 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 there was no way for music. I wasn't doing musicals. They weren't needing singing, at least the shows that I was doing wasn't required at all. I just missed it terribly. So I eventually got involved with, with cabaret, um, which was fun because you could be autonomous with that. You weren't not waiting for the phone to ring. You could get together with your music director and your director and build a show and then call a couple of clubs. And if the first one said no, the second or third would say yes. And pretty soon you had a show, but having a show in two months means that you have to be singing every day. So even if it was only six shows a year, it meant that you had to work it. You had to keep at your, keep at your singing. And I, I studied with a, a cantor for, for seven years. He was a great teacher for me, just a vocal teacher. So he kind of kept me on my, kept me on my toes. <laughs> yeah, it's just great. The cabaret is uh, wonderful. And it's, uh, you know, it's a very interesting art form because you are singing and then telling stories and then singing and then telling stories. And it's a constant weaving in and out and flow mm -hmm. uh, as you're sort of playing with and entertaining the audience that feels like they're a part of it and they're interacting as well. You love cabaret? I do. I think it's a very elastic uh, art form. I, I love doing it and I love going to see it. Nicholas King, you mentioned uh, he's one of my favorites. I mean, he's remarkable jazz stylist and so you know charming and personable on stage but you i mean I, there is such a treasure trove of incredible cabaret performers and and collectively it's really it's about something it's a witness to the human spirit it's also it's very simple you know there are no pyrotechnics there're not going to be any dragons coming up through the floor and no special effects of sound it's just a few people, sometimes two people, just on stage, singing some pretty songs and and talking about life, and you feel a companion. I think, especially now, I'm I'm drawn to the cabaret as an art form because we're, you know, coming out of COVID and all the separation that we have. But we lot we spend a lot of time in virtual. I do anyway in virtual space. And with cabaret, you're there, you're in the room, you're rubbing elbows, you're hearing someone else's story, you're hearing them breathe. I mean, sometimes, though, you you get a little more uh, close with an audience member that you than you intend. <laughs> I was doing a show in London a couple months ago, and the fellow in the front row passed out. I mean, literally, conk in the middle of the song. It was like, oh my gosh, are you okay? And there was a doc called for a doctor in the house, and. So we we sort of we got to know each other pretty well over there. He did not die, although at first I thought he had. But anyway, so there's that tends to bring a group together. It's like, oh boy, we went through a, a little moment of life here that was yeah. real. 
Sometimes you also have people in the audience and you either find out in advance that they are there rooting what? you on or you find out after. And wasn't there a time when Catherine Hepburn happened to be in the vicinity? <laughs> yeah, there was. That was terrifying. She she was doing a play with Julie Harris. That's why Catherine came. Miss Hepburn came. And it was Miss Hepburn, so she was not very comfortable being out in the in the lobby before the performance. So she was sitting backstage in the dressing room before the show. So all we could certainly I could think about during the entire performance is that oh my gosh, Catherine Hepburn is in the house, and uh, it was it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. She, then I years later I did another play, and and she was in the house again, and. That was a little easier because I had sort of braced myself. But I think, yeah, that was the first time for me uh, doing a, a performance, a live performance where someone of that magnitude was was in the house. And it's it's a mind bender, I tell you what. It really, really is. I can only imagine. And just to have their love and support uh, can be reassuring as well. On so well, that's not what's screaming in your head as you're doing. Yeah. You're hearing, yeah. oh my God, she thinks I'm terrible. Why did I say the right. last <laughs> bullshit? Oh my God, why do I ever think I can? That's yeah. the dialogue. You're sort of re editing, bad. right? <laughs> Well, when you are getting ready to perform mm. um, on stage specifically, mm. what what is the process like? Are you, obviously you're preparing days and days and days before, but are there certain routines, certain things that you do with your voice? Are there certain um, sleep patterns, foods that you eat, certain things you do once you get to the venue that are part of your routine to get things set up so then when you do, when those lights do shine on you, you can take control. And I'm sure, like for any of us that do anything in the public eye, mm. there's all the excitement and the fervor and the preparation. And then for some strange reason, just before you're about to do it, there's almost this nauseating Oh, yeah. Dread. Oh, yeah. you see your <laughs> the butterflies, out. right? Yeah, yeah for sure. What's your process like in, in getting ready to take on the the stage? Just asking the question, I'm starting to hyperventilate. Um, <laughs> water. She needs water. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess it starts however many weeks before, and uh, it's a lot of repetition, 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 you know, of just of just going through the material and um uh, so that's that's my sort of safety net, I guess, uh, that it becomes uh, well, that it's in you in many ways. It's in it's it's sort of in your muscle memory in in, in various ways. Um, and then as you're kind of getting close to it, two days before, I guess, let's see. So if I'm doing a show Saturday, let's say <laughs> Friday, on Thursday, yeah, on Thursday I would do my last full out vocal rehearsal of the show. Um, the day before, I basically don't sing, just really go into a deep vocal rest. The day of, <laughs> I'll take some sort of a class or some kind of a physical activity. I mean, that that's all part and parcel. I find that cardio all the right the way along is enormously helpful, weirdly helpful for your voice. Anyway, the day of, some sort of physical activity, walk, hike, take a class, something or other. Um, eat early afternoon, so you're not burping through the show. Um, <laughs> and then the show, what I call show poison starts. It's just mm. this horrible, like, uh, mm. you know, feeling of, 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 and I think what it is actually is adrenaline. I think yeah. if someone sort of took a blood test and said, this is what's going on, don't worry. Right. It would be, it's just adrenaline. It's just that's kind of gathering of your of your cells your cells are like okay it's gonna be eight o'clock soon and kind of getting gear but it's like an overload of some weird you know excitement and 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 terror combination um and then you get to the venue and you do your sound check and you're with the guys or the girls and you you kind of loosen up and you kind of move into the room a little bit and then you get your pantyhose on, get your lashes on and say a quick prayer and jump off the, the cliff, you know, and hope for the best. Uh, so 
yeah but it's always joyful it's always different and especially working with ted for my music director now of 16 years we've done oh yeah he's just i think he's actually not from this planet i think he's from someplace other because he channels the universe through his music and this show we have coming up on the first with diva jazz orchestra i mean it's fun for every reason. They're phenomenal musicians. They've been together for a long time. So you feel that that trust and that weave between them. But also coming, we're right in the middle of Women's International or Women's History Month. And yeah. so it feels especially powerful to be doing this, this show with them right now. What's it like, you know, the collaborative process when you, you know, it takes a village oftentimes and to, to collaborate and work with everybody and fine tune it and tweak it. And that must be a, a thrilling feeling as well, knowing everybody has their little piece of the puzzle to yeah. make everything come to life. Well, we build a show. It's Ted and a wonderful brilliant woman, Deborah Grace Weiner, who's been in New York for such a long time. She started as a colleague and now she's chosen family as well as being a colleague. But Deb ran the 92nd Street Y um, Lyrics and Lyricists series. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of the Great American Songbook. She's the person that knows the how, when the verse was written at 2 a.m. on the back of somebody's cocktail napkin and, you know, in somebody's back bathroom. She has, she has all those stories. Um, so we, we, I come up with a theme and sort of some rough ideas. It's like a lump of clay. I call it a splat and I'll call Deb and say, Deb, I want to do a show about, and she's like, oh dear Lord. Okay. Uh, we'll jump in. And then the same thing to Ted. And then we come up with, so everybody comes up with their list of songs that we think what might fit into this. I'll come up with several songs that are like a feel of something I want. I want this kind of rhythm on this song. Anyway, we jump in a room together and we sit together, you know, for several days, a couple of hours of pretty intense sessions, very, very joyful. And eventually it starts to, to, to come together. But now that we've done, um, these are, you know, with the four albums and I don't know how many shows the three of us have, have come up with, um, it's just, I'm so lucky to have this, this smarty pants team. Mm. Really? Yeah. You've got some good people surrounding you for sure and support, which I think is amazing. The, are you involved in um, any of the arranging or, or any of that as it's going along too here and there? Ideas of it. Yes. I, I, I have definite ideas about a feel or, uh, you know, putting, adding the verse of this song into the chorus of another. Uh, but it really is a, it really is a collaboration. I mean, Ted does the poor Ted. I'll say, Ted, I wanted to feel like you're in the, in a jungle and, and that the dragon is chasing her. And, and then she just, she chops the tree down and the Ted goes, uh-huh. And then he puts <laughs> that, bless his heart, and he puts it into an arrangement. He turns it into music. So, that's how we work. I come at it from a, you know, crazy, stupid storytelling point of view. And, but, it, you know, after 15 years, it's like, okay, I think I got it. And, you know, and off we go. Which is terrific. Tell us about this and congratulations. I mean, you've put out a lot of music for our viewers watching. Uh, you, you definitely got to pick up the music because it's absolutely incredible. You can go to Amazon and everywhere. This could be the start. Tell us about the inspiration and what it was like creating this. And congratulations on this as well, Linda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we started the project. We knew we wanted to do another album and we started it right before COVID. And so we had, I don't even remember what the theme was, but we were working on it. And then the world shut down and everybody went away. So we sort of you know, continued on Zoom. We tried a few Zoom kind of, then the theme changed because the world had changed. And I think it changed like three times. Now, finally, we're coming out of, of COVID and we at last were able to sit in a room together. And it felt like we were all coming across a threshold, you know, and it was, it was a moment of starting afresh, starting anew. And so that became the theme of the, uh, of the album. Not that anybody would necessarily pick up on that, but that was sort of our 
true north kind of direction. Um, so, and, you know, things, things you can start out and it's the wrong path and you have to reboot. So in this, in the album, there are a couple songs where you kind of fall apart and, you know, and then, and then reboot, but um, songs like let's get lost. That seemed like uh, a, a one point, one way to begin. It's let's get, let's get found by, by getting lost. Um, there's uh what else do we have on? I don't remember what we, anyway, we got a bunch of good songs and I hope everybody listens to it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. How'd you come up with the title? I love it. It's the song. It's the Steve yeah. Allen song. That's um, right. And yeah. it's, you know, it talks about, he talks about that in it's sort of the happenstance of life that it, it could just, it can happen at any moment and you can, you know, come out of your hotel room and, and, and you meet someone or on a street corner or in a restaurant, you, someone catches your eye or, you know, life is so, uh, can be so uh, seemingly random intersections where life moves forward. You know, I think it's beautiful too. And, and I knew this when we chatted last and just in following your extraordinary career, you have um, a deep, sense of inspiration, empowerment, uh, empathy, compassion, um, faith yeah, in there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really, um, you know, you come at things from a very deep humanistic, uh, connecting level. Mm. Um, where do you think that comes from? What are, it's as if you are a, a conduit a facilitator of this energy greater than yourself that is flowing through and out of you. Uh, and we're, you know, the beneficiaries of your art, but there's energy that's that you're collecting flowing through you. And that comes out on stage and film television and everything that you do. There, there is this deep sense of understanding of the human condition and inspiration and, uh, empathy and compassion and spirituality, right? Good heavens. Okay. If I'm having a stinky day, I'm going to call you. You're going to give me a pep talk. That's absolutely generous, generous things to say. Well, I think I'm 106 years old now. So when you've done that, you know, you've had ups and downs, right? And so, um, and one of the many advantages of having kind of a down in moment is that you you know that that place exists. So when someone else is going through it, you can't help but feel empathic because you know it, it's real. And 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 uh, so, but also the thrill of knowing that that you can come through the whatever those valleys are that you know people that we face to greater and, and lesser degrees. You know, so I think there's 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 that. Also, I uh, I I'm a mommy, and. <sighs> what better school is there? I mean, it brings you to your knees. It takes you up to the best mountaintops ever. You, you meet so many incredible people from all different walks of life that you otherwise would never meet, except for the fact that they're on the soccer team or they, you know, you're in the classes together or you're at whatever you're, you're doing, you know, playing with your kids and playing on the beach or chasing a dog. Um, you know, so it, I mean, really it's the, it's the, I mean, what is what what can you not say about being a parent? I understand you are one of sixteen, so your mother would be able to articulate this much. Better than <laughs> I, but, you know, it's the deepest, most profound joy. It's the most profound uh, spiritual journey you could hope to privilege privilege of our of our lives, and and uh, so and a white knuckle, thrilling, wonderful ride. And also, I, I'm in love. At, and himself happens to be here. So I'm going to bring him in. But, you know, that oh, are, you, are you talking about the birthday boy? Yeah, the birthday boy. There I mean, he is. The birthday boy. And there he is with his cake. Look yeah. at that shot. <laughs> uh, yeah. Of course, we're talking about the wonderful Patrick Duffy. Yeah, there he is. Isn't he handsome? Patrick, yeah, yeah, you guys look so good together. I tell <laughs> you, it really is. It's amazing how life brings people together, isn't That's it? Because you've known each other through the years and had mm -hmm. interaction, and then the moon's lined up, and there you are. And it's mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful, sweet spot that you're both in, isn't it? It's, it it's, is. is. And timing is everything. I mean, yeah. it's not just a cliche. Uh, we have known of each other 
for almost 50 years. Yeah. And the times that we met over those 50 years, yeah. there was never this feeling. It was we weren't in this position in our lives to feel this way about each other. Yeah. And when it happened, it was it was inexorable. It it was a must be a must <laughs> pursue. Uh, the time is right. So mm -hmm. we have a phrase now, which we use all the time, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that really is the, the, the genesis, the start of our true relationship, which happened three and a half years ago. It was, this is the when, this is the now. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that feeling continues on a daily basis. It's, it's remarkable to get this at at the ripe old age of 75. <laughs> I tell you, God bless you both. Truly. Was it a project? Was it a party? What brought you guys together? It was an it was accident. A, it was a disaster. <laughs> yeah, in the sense of it was, it was COVID that actually oh, brought yeah. us together. Yeah. Um, we, we had known each other and we had a mutual friend that I was doing a play with in London. And over the years we'd run into each other, but Linda came over to see the play uh, and see Richard Thomas, who was, who was doing the play. I was about doing the 25 play with years him. ago. Yeah. yeah. And we said, hello. And literally Linda and I, hello, nice to see you. And they mm. went off to dinner yeah. and disappeared. And then 20 years later that we were at an event at opposite ends of this gigantic room at an event, I was with Linda Gray, my dear friend and Linda, this Linda, there's too many Lindas in my life. Mm. This Linda had done a TV movie with Miss Gray. And one of Linda's friends said, oh, Miss Gray is at the other side of the room. You should go say hello. And so Linda came over, but my Linda was gone for some reason. And we started talking again. And we talked about our mutual friend that I hadn't seen in years. So I gave Linda my phone number and my email. She was going back to New York and was going to see Richard. And a couple of weeks later, I got a lovely picture of the two of them. Hi, mm -hmm. from New York. And with the three of us started then conversing and texting and talking. And then COVID hit almost immediately. Um, Linda's play was canceled. My film was canceled. Uh, Richard went off to, to be with his family again. So Linda and I started communicating long distance. I was in Oregon and she was in Colorado. But that was, talk about this could be the start. That was the start. And we didn't know it. We didn't know it. We were just saying, what are you doing? Uh, yeah. I'm washing my vegetables. What are it's you so doing? Uh, yeah. uh, but we only had each other to talk to. So every night we would talk on the phone for a few minutes. And then finally we started doing FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And we would just, but alone in her house, alone in my house. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we started, it, it happened instead of once a week, it happened every couple of days. Then it happened every day. And then we got into what, what uh, Zoom. Mm -hmm. So when we started Zooming, it was just nonstop. So every night, literally for two and a half months, we would Zoom mm -hmm. in a, not even in a conversation, just to be together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'd listen to music. Sometimes we would read poetry. Sometimes we'd just talk. Um, and then one night, uh, we did this for two <laughs> and a half months for several hours every night. Uh, one night, just before I hung up, I said, well, you're getting tired. I can see you're yawning. Why don't you go to sleep? I'll talk to you tomorrow, 7 o'clock. Yeah, 7 o'clock. Okay, bye-bye. I said, goodbye now. I love you. And I hung up. And I went, oh, my God. I said the L word. <laughs> and that's literally changed the entire yeah. trajectory of everything after that. The next couple of days was... Hi, how Hi. are you? How are you? <laughs> but every night after that, it was, okay, good night. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I love you. Goodbye. And shortly thereafter, um, first Linda, being the heroic Yankee girl she is, says, I can drive from Colorado to Oregon. And I said, no, that's just not the gentleman. <laughs> so I got in my car and I drove from Oregon to uh, Colorado, ended up on her driveway. And we have not been apart since. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's the start of something incredible. Yeah. It really is. And uh, you know, you can see it when when you see pictures of you guys and and stories and that there's it's a, it's a very it's a blessing and and it's mm -hmm. infectious because the energy that you're putting out, the love for one another is apparent and it's strong. And I think it's very inspiring for, for other people to see yeah, the hope. two of you together. You, you have fun mm -hmm. with one another. You admire one another. You respect one another. Mm -hmm. Your individual you know, contributions to entertainment and the arts. 
and there's this deep love for one another and playfulness that is very evident. Yeah. And I think it's a very cool thing. And then you share it uh, glowingly. Mm. And I think it's a beautiful thing that the world, you know, can use more of that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, okay. And especially, you know, again, we're, we're certainly not decrepit, but to, to be this in love, like teenagers at our age, I have been told by so many people how it inspires them in their 50s and 60s when they're alone and not and thinking it's done, it's over. Yeah. And I say, no, it's never over. <laughs> Just keep your eyes and your ears open and it can sneak up on you. And I know that you guys, uh, you know, you've performed together. Would you ever consider doing a, a TV series or something together with this kind of theme, love coming together later on, sort of the meeting that happens? I mean, what a wonderful story that would be, you know, either, we'll, we'll you know, like a Hallmark movie or, you know, or a series or something. It's, it's, several people, when they heard our story, said, oh, well, that's a Hallmark movie. You should do it, which, of course, we would. But we've also found that, you know, we've been performing separately for our 50-year careers, but we work very well together. Yeah. We love working together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many times people say, oh, it's so yeah, good yeah. when you work together, but then you got to go home because you got, no, we, we love yeah. coming to work together, working together and going home together. And we, we respect a, each other's work. Yeah. Uh, it's, deeply. It's fun. I, we we uh, did a play on the road in England for seven months and mm -hmm. every week we were moving new theater, new theater. And it was, it, it was so much fun. And, and it wouldn't have been fun, frankly, had we not been together. Right. Well, I don't think we would have done it if we, anyway, that was, that was, uh, yeah. That but we've was. done TV movies together. Mm -hmm. We've done the, the one thing which we had to get used to doing was that we are in love and live together. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've worked for my all my years on television and I've never kissed my co-star after the scene was over. You know, or, or <laughs> pat, pat me on the bottom. <laughs> she did once, as she does every time, but she did one scene when we were doing the film together, and she was so <laughs> superb in it. It was the, just it was. Well, I heard her talking to you about doing a play with Julie Harris, and it mm. was a, a, a master class. Well, watching her on film is a master class. Oh, so after she got done with this scene, I just walked up to her. I said, "That was so good," and I gave her a little affectionate pat on the bottom, and she what? gave me a look like. <laughs> Well, my, no co-star has ever done that to me before. A love tap. <laughs> no, 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 we're it's actually okay. together. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, at this point, I mean, this is one of the many ways in which Patrick and I are, are in sync. If somebody calls and they're offering us a job, either one of us, the answer is yes. And then what's the script? Yeah. You know, I mean, we just were work junkies. We enjoy it. Never had a bad day at work. Yeah. It's always fun. There's always something to learn from it, mm -hmm. no matter no matter what. And we've we, met some of the best people in our lives. Oh yeah, on the on yeah, the sets for sure. working, for sure. uh, forged relationships that have lasted forever until one of the other is gone, and and that's such a beautiful thing to be able to download something so intense in a short period of time that can last so long. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it's it's a dream come true mm -hmm. to be in this business and to be in it with Linda is the is the best. It's really. Something. I'm going to do a really stupid segue here. We have we we are in the business, and then we are in the business together. Patrick and the I business. started a company uh, a couple of years ago now, and we Patrick has had this wonderful sourdough starter that's been in his family for over seventy years, and he makes these outrageous, you know, goodies from it, and uh, people love them. And Patrick one night said, "Oh, I should start a business." It's like, of course you should. So knowing absolutely nothing about business, we we jumped into this. And, it, and it's been one of the amazing things, though, is that there's been work as an actor or an actress translates into anything. So you start with an idea. Usually, I mean, in our business, it's a script. And then you get your team. And eventually, you actually have a product to show for this. And, and this business was very much the same way. We had an idea. Patrick had an idea. We wrote it down. We kind of made up a business plan. And then we got our team, which were a bunch of smarty pants business people who said, do this, do that, form this. This is the legal. This is the whatnot. And then you had, we launched our product, which is kind of your opening night. <laughs> so that's been, it's been a kind of going back to school for us because we didn't know the the verbiage, the anything. 
but we've learned and it's been, it's been really fun to really fun to do it together. And there have been steps forward and several steps backwards and then a few more steps forward. So we just kind of chug, chug along. But the reason, I mean, and and this again is that the reason that we even wanted to do a business is not that we wanted to work that hard, but we wanted to do something that would survive after reruns, you know, (laughs) after, after our careers had done their thing, which we've been very grateful for. It's been remarkable. But uh, there's a phrase that a good friend of ours used, and we've adopted it. Is we feel that there's a, there's an opportunity to to leave a legacy mm-hmm. that's not just a, the body of your television work. But w- what value can we create on a continual basis, even when our careers are done and we're done? And mm-hmm. so, a hundred percent of our net profits on this business go to charity. So we're not in it to make money. We don't make money. Um, (laughs) As a matter of fact, we're just barely now starting to be able to to donate to food-based charities, uh, Feeding Mm -hmm. the Hungry, No Kid Hungry, uh, you know, any food-based kind of thing is where all the net profits from this company are going. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're in. You know, we're a tiny, weeny, beeny, teeny uh, Newman's own. Yeah, we're a Newman's own wannabe. Yeah, we're wannabe Newman's own. But that's a, that's why we're doing it. And mm-hmm. and as it grows, you know, so will our ability to create some value with it. Mm-hmm. What a beautiful thing to be doing, giving back like that, and uh, you know, in doing it in a way that helps others. I think mm-hmm. it's it's extraordinary. Again, it just shows the character of the two of you. You know, a lot of people know the two of you for the iconic things you've been involved in, in television and film and stage and so much more. But when they hear stories like that about giving back and rolling up your sleeves and diving in to, to honor and celebrate people, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing that you're both doing. Thank thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's really something quite special. And, you know, I had heard that during the pandemic, the number one thing that people were doing, they were baking sourdough bread. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it is one of the fastest growing mm-hmm. uh, food businesses now in the mm-hmm. country. So we're we're hoping that it'll continue to grow and yeah. expand and reach new avenues of, of accessibility for people. What did you uh, each learn during the, um, I, Linda, the last time we chatted, uh, it, the pandemic was sort of racing. Um, mm-hmm. What did you learn about yourselves uh, during Mm. this time of reflection and everything that we've experienced, we've witnessed, and that we've all gone through at our various levels. What are some things you've learned about life and about yourself and and going forward through it all? Mm. Well, for me, you know, I think there's a tendency when people look at, at careers like Linda's and mine that they think, well, you have it all. You've been so fortunate, you know, what, what, there's nothing you can't do, et cetera. COVID erased all of those parameters and they really allowed both of us, and I'll speak for myself, to, to just shave away all of the externals. You know, I had no power. I had no influence. Uh, I was in survival mode. I was literally a single man living in the middle of the wilderness on, a, on my place in Oregon. And it was a, you mentioned self-reflection, but it's not just pondering. It's Mm -hmm. really deciding the value placement of everything in your life. Mm -hmm. You literally, it's like cleaning your closet. You go through everything. You go, don't need it. Don't need it. I like Mm -hmm. that. I'll remember that. Don't need that. Don't need that. And in the course of a very short period of time, it didn't take the entire COVID years. It took a short period of time to realize, oh, this is more valuable than X, Y, and Z. And I think that carried over. Once COVID was done, the, those value um, categories uh, are consistent in my life now that they weren't necessarily before. And I think if if everybody takes a cold, hard look at what happened to them in COVID, it, it, notwithstanding the absolute tragedy of losing someone, but every other mm-hmm. discomfort that you may have gone through during COVID, is a great learning curve, a mm. potential to create great value. And that's what I got out of COVID personally. How about you, Linda? <laughs> Beautifully said, Patrick, really. Yeah. Beautifully yeah. said. How about you, Linda? Oh, gosh. Well, let's see. I gained a few pounds. <laughs> um, well, you know why? Because they told us that we had to be six feet 
apart from one another, but they yeah. failed to mention we're supposed to be 10 feet away from our refrigerators. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a few things. Uh, I, I think there were many things that I, I took for granted. Uh, we may have spoken about this last time, but live arts is one of them. And I did mm. not realize until I could not go to a museum or a gallery or a concert or a recital or performance or cabaret, whatever, uh, how much I rely on the arts to help me just process life in general, you know, help me laugh, help me have a good time, help me escape, help me think, provoke me to think. So I, I, I do not take going to the arts for granted at all anymore. Um, and I, I realized their value. Touch was something. To not be able to touch someone, touch anyone. I'm sort of a huggy feely with my pals and stuff. And not to be able to, I mean, to have gone for a couple of months to not physically pat someone on the back or feel, that was huge. Uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was big. And that, you know, just the preciousness of, of time, that time, time is limited. Time is limited. So it uh, it sort of dusted off, uh, you know, if there was a, a, a callous thought in me, I think that sort of got got whittled down. And, and just the, the gratitude for my for my friends, really, that uh, as and family, certainly that, uh, you know, when something's taken away, you see its value. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely and right. And contrast. You guys have, you know, led such very busy, demanding lives. What What are some things that you go to? What are your go to things that you like to do, or places you like to go to to counter to to balance being in the limelight, always being busy and called upon? What are some like for me here on the East Coast? I, I've love the ocean the ocean is a very yeah. important thing for me swimming yeah. surfing boogie boarding it's it's greater than i am it's more powerful than i am but mm -hmm. if i respect it i'll have a good time and i just yeah. there's something grounding about the the ocean for me well, how about you guys well we i mean i would say a, na a connection to nature is is profound for for both of us when patrick had his ranch in in oregon my primary home now our primary home is Colorado. So that um, just that touchstone of nature, the air, being able to take a hike and t take in those vistas, it does put things into perspective. We spend time in Mexico on the water there. And that's also uh, enormously restorative. It's just, it's centering, it's, you know, it's calming, it's quiet. It's uh, yeah. Personally also, I must say, um, I take great sustenance, if I want to put it that way, of all the things that you've been saying about nature in, in the company of Linda. And, and yeah, you know, nice. because life can get hectic at times or busy or all encompassing, to me, there's nothing more restorative than uh, spending two days in the house. <laughs> which we did. We, the other we day were when snowed we were in. Snowed yeah, in but, which but, was great. But it was. <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm a, I'm, I tend to gravitate towards being a solitary person. Um, so you know, that's the best of both worlds. I'm solitary, but mm -hmm. I'm sharing that solitude mm -hmm. with somebody that I would rather be with than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So those moments to me are, are, are what I've brought out of, of, you know, COVID and then the benefit of COVID being with Linda and now yeah. being able to just be there where we are right now, just yeah. sitting somewhere, our shoulders touching to me, I could spend another, you know, five hours with a book right here like this. <laughs> Linda Pearl, Patrick Duffy is deeply in love with you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, he now. sure is boy. I tell you just to, he, he, he glows, you know, and, and you do too. You, you could see it. It's just yeah, such a beautiful beautiful thing, you know, to, um, you never know where life takes you, right? You just never that's know. True. That's you know, so true. Yep. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. Again, yeah. Gratitude. yeah. It, it really is something very special. You, um, are you, <laughs> are you bringing Patrick into the singing world too, uh, Linda? Uh, look, look folks, <laughs> one head's going this way and the other one's going this way. <laughs> Well, here's the difference. Yeah, here's the difference. I can put on a pair of tap shoes. It doesn't mean I can dance. 
She yeah. can bring me into the music world. It doesn't mean I can sing. So I am part of her music world now, which mm -hmm. I treasure. Uh, there's yeah. nothing more beautiful than watching the process she was describing to you, uh -huh. the working up towards a performance, the practicing in the house, the getting ready, the I know when to leave her alone you know, in, in the most respectful of ways of, of, okay, this is her preparation time. You know, she's, she's in the, in the zone now and I'll be there in the back of the house applauding, but it's her show now. So all of that is, is to me just the most beautiful part of all of this. Mm -hmm. And I am not going to get up there and warble. He can sing. I'm no, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little teaser yeah. there. <laughs> well, the, but the, the other thing which I will say is, is she, in every conversation that I've had an opinion that I thought was right, she's proven that she has been right and I have been mistaken. <laughs> and I, I say that with uh, gratitude. Uh, it's, it's not an easy hurdle to overcome every oh, once geez. in a while. But um, oh, I'll never say never. Oh, but um, you, you won't be us doing a, a, a duet album. Trust right. me. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, Linda, you, I know you love to travel. You've gone to so many different places, mm -hmm. huh? Mm -hmm. That's something yeah. that you enjoy doing. I do. I'm, I'm grateful now, too, that I got to do it over the decades that I did. I, for several years, I was running international theater festivals. So my poor son, he was little, we'd grab him and the homework and the soccer ball and off we'd go and circumnavigate the globe and you know, see plays uh, in different quadrants of, of the world. But yeah, I think it, um, <clears throat> you know, you get to walk uh, at least a, a few yards in somebody else's moccasins and that global perspective is, is, is helpful that there's, it's just, it's a, it's a constant lesson that there's always another way to look at something. There's always another take, there's a, another way to voice something. Um, so I, I think travel for me has been very uh, hugely influential. It's been a lot of, a lot of joy, but also now there are a handful of countries I've been able to revisit um, several decades later and Boy, time marches on. I mean, how cities have changed characters. They've grown, they've fallen apart. And that, that's very interesting to see. I mean, just how swiftly history moves. So yeah, I do, I do enjoy. I struggle with a couple of languages. In fact, going back to Japan now soon, I jumped into Duolingo to kind of see if I had any remnants of Japanese left in And you do. I did. Even the language has changed. The language is much less formal than when I was there. My Japanese is very archaic now. So uh, anyway, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a joyful thing. I was speaking today with this extraordinary woman who runs a jazz club in Minneapolis called Crooners, and she's involved with a charity uh, helping women in Laos and Cambodia and Thailand and India. I mean, it's mind blowing. So that's, you know, she does purpose driven travel. And th I think that's what really in intrigues me now. If there's, if you can go someplace, but find a way into the culture to participate, in, which we've been lucky to do on location. You get to do that. You mm -hmm. suddenly you're, I don't know, in Germany or England or Italy, or and you're working with local crew members and local actors and um it's it's an immediate crossing of a threshold into mm -hmm. someone else's experience yeah which is fantastic and uh, patrick recently you got a chance to fly through the crazy weather up to hartford connecticut to be with the step-by-step -step family huh yes yeah i mean uh, it, again our, our careers are are such gifts uh, to us. Uh, I, I did uh, step by step in my situation comedy 20 years ago. We did it in 1991 to 98. And uh, the kids that played kids on the show, for instance, one young girl played my daughter on the show. She started the show at the age of 12. So I just spent the weekend with all of them. She is now the mother of two. Mm -hmm. She's a director and producer of television. Um, my other daughter, who was 15 when she started the show is now an assistant DA district attorney in the city of Los Angeles. Um, 
my, the boy who played my son is a real estate tycoon now uh, mm -hmm. doing triple rent. Thing. I don't even know the verbiage that he uses. Um, so all of these people I got to be with again, and I still hold the position of father. Aww. And it was, and they're all, uh, in essence, television adopted family, but they are my family. And yeah. I have such yeah. pride in yeah. their, in their progress and their accomplishments as I do my own two boys and my grandchildren. So the, the, beauty of our careers is that you get to revisit your past in such a joyful way on a regular basis. So it was worth digging our way out of the snow drifts and finally getting a red eye or a red eye in the morning flight to mm. Hartford, Connecticut, and then jump into uh, a 20 year time warp mm. with the dearest people that I've worked with. So, uh, you know, and we'll do it again at some point for sure. Speaking of the dearest people, we had not that long ago the wonderful Linda Gray wow. with us, grace us with her wonderful uh, elegance and presence. Yep. And she talked fondly about working with you and Larry Hagman and the whole team at uh, Dallas. Right. Uh, did you ever expect a series like that to become such an iconic part of American culture? No, and, and none of us did uh, in the early years, in the first couple of years. Um, again, reflecting what Linda said earlier, the, the phone rings and somebody says, I've got this job. And you go, OK, I'll be there. What is it? You don't say, what is it? I'll be there. You, you say, absolutely, I'll come. So we all started Dallas. And at the end of the pilot, which was five episodes, we were all on our phones to our agents going, OK, this job's over. I may never work again. What, what can we find? Um, and then it hit and then it became what it was. Uh, and that's that's rare. That's when you're sprinkled with stardust when that happens. Um, and to to have been on that show for a, finally a total of of 13 years uh, is an amazing gift. And to be on a show with two of the dearest friends that I've ever had, Linda Gray and Larry Hagman, um, from the day we met, literally till the day Haggy passed, we were best friends. And to have that and be able to go play with them on a regular basis is a, is a gift that is rare in our business. So I, I got out of Dallas and turned right around and started step by step and had the same experience for another seven years. So, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate. Um, I think it's very funny to use the word icon, but I've come to accept it only because of the power of the influence of those shows over the years. Um, at, opposed to icon, I, I consider myself a hood ornament. <laughs> you know, I, I was fortunate to be put on the front of the big automobile that was Dallas with Larry and Linda. And then that pushed us forward in our lives and our careers. And I'm quite sure if I tried to deconstruct it backwards, um, that possibly Linda and I would not be sitting here right now had not Dallas happened and all of these other things. So um, I'm filled with gratitude for every single thing that's ever happened in my life, primarily also my 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 family first and my career second. I had asked Linda some of the inspirations in her life, maybe from family and others coming up the ranks in her journey. Uh, how about you? Did, did you have early uh, moments of mentors, people who've inspired you, maybe people within the family? How did you first you know, get your feet wet and dive into this uh, industry? My, my immediate family had no cultural connection uh, at all. If I go back another generation, my grandfather, which has nothing to do with me because it's music, but he had his own little orchestra in Montana. I think it was about a six piece orchestra called Harry Starrett and the Merrymakers. So that was the only connection with the art forms that I can even trace in my family. I started doing after school plays in junior high, not thinking of it as a career, but just because those were the people that I liked hanging out with. Um, and it wasn't until graduation of, of high school that I considered acting as a profession uh, and never film, just I was going to do theater and that was it. So life just kept throwing me uh, different options that I was able to blindly choose and they turned out to always be the correct decisions. Um, so, uh, you know, my sister is a policewoman. You know, she retired now. She was the first uh, female police officer in the Seattle City Police Department. But there was never a, a cultural hook in, in my family until until my, my inspirations were television, to be quite honest. 
I found myself enacting what I would see on television and mm. just pretending. But it was in Montana and it was Cowboys and Indians time anyway. So you were always running out pretending to be either an Indian or a cowboy. So when I would watch TV, I would just do what they did. And I kept doing that. And then I was inspired uh, once I became an actor still uh, by what I would see. You know, I was inspired by the Jimmy Stewart's of the world, you know, and the Henry Fonda's and, and the Spencer Tracy's and the Michael Landon's, uh, you know, uh, they, they were all accessible prototypes that I thought, oh, I love that. I want to be like that. Um, and then once I started working, of course, then all the people that can come on a set and inspire you are always there, you know, guest stars and people that, you know, and people ask me what the best advice I got. And it, they think it's a joke when I said that an, a, a very famous television actor just told me, he said, always hang up your wardrobe before you leave your dressing room. Mm -hmm. And to me that I find that today so inspiring because it came from a, what I considered a giant in the business whose main attitude when working was how to take care of everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't just take your clothes and throw them on the floor because mm -hmm. those, those wardrobe people pick them up and iron them and they'll be hanging up for me in the morning. No, he was always thinking of, no, I do that. Put the prop back where you got it. You know, you know, don't leave your coffee cup on your chair so that the, they have to, in other words, take care of everybody else. It was the best advice I ever got. Has producing and directing been something that you've also uh, enjoyed and being a part of? Well, Linda's a producer. Her yeah. mentality is a producer. Mine, yeah. uh, producing is not something that I know how to do. Um, directing, yes. Uh, I, I, I would love to, and I have directed a lot. Um, and that's something that's very satisfying. But writing, uh, it scares me to look at a blank piece of paper. Producing, I, I can't make a phone call. I can't make those kind of tough decisions. Or uh, Can't might not be the right word, but I, it's not my comfort level. Um, but Linda is so proficient at all those things and has an artist's eye. Uh, so again, I think that's the beauty of, of being together is that together we, we can do that if we decide to do it uh, as a team. Uh, we could accomplish all of those things. Um, I accept her direction and points of view as she does mine. Um, it's never territorial. Mm -hmm. It's always, oh, my God, that's the best advice I ever got kind of feeling. So, um, yeah, producing and directing and, and acting as a group and each of us mm -hmm. taking our own responsibilities. Uh, the more time I can spend together with her and the less time on other projects without her, the happier I am. If you did go into the uh, world of entertainment and, and all of the incredible things you've done, Patrick, was there a plan B? Was there something else that you <laughs> loved doing that you might have pursued? Oh, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was going to be an architect. Uh, my father was a carpenter. I apprenticed with my father as a carpenter. And I thought the next step up in the great American dream of doing, you know, you're, you always want your children to do better than you. I thought, well, I could be an architect. And that's the next step up from being a carpenter. And uh, a drama teacher in high school said, I think you could earn a living as an actor. If you want, I'll write a letter of recommendation to this school. I said, OK. And I went back and I, I remember it specifically. I walked into the house a little trailer house that we lived in. And my dad was reading the paper and I said, dad, I'm not going to be an architect. I've decided to be an actor. And he just lowered the paper and said, oh, okay. And then he put the paper back up and started reading. So, uh, you know, I had a fallback. I still love doing carpentry. Um, I love tinkering around the house and repairing things. Um, so it still is my fallback. If my career falls apart, <laughs> <laughs> I've still got all my own tools. Call me. I'll come fix your door. If you don't get in any hit shows or anything like that, right? <laughs> I, I got a truckload of tools. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because I studied architecture and design too, along with broadcasting and television and mm -hmm. all the rest. And I love it. I, uh, whenever I'm in the city, I don't look down. I always look up. Oh, yes. and, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. yeah, the 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 buildings, yeah. the the lights, the shadows, the angles. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a beautiful thing. I, I'll go over the same bridge in the car and always look at the view, mm -hmm. and not just appreciate the view, 
but be marveled by the fact that I'm in a car going over this yes. incredible feat yes. of engineering yes. Yes. that's yes. going yes. over this fast moving river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. <laughs> the, the, the things we take that. for granted, right? Yeah, for sure. That's great. That's wonderful. What's the plan B for you, Linda, if you didn't pursue theater and film and television and grace us with all of your wonderful, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. wonderfulness? <laughs> I like teaching. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would have taught. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't really have, you know, just hope for the bike. I, I can do uh, I don't iron. I'm a terrible typer. So I don't have much of a fallback. It was kind of this or but no, sourdough yeah. bread. Sourdough yeah. bread. That's no, right. But yeah. I have seen her when she says teaching, um, you were mentioning David Craig. Uh, mm. She could be that kind of teacher. I've seen her mentor several young people who have asked her questions and it's never, oh, well, lick your lips, hit your mark and say your lines, <laughs> not that kind of thing. She immediately goes into the craft and into the preparation and into the inspiration. And she would make an incredible uh, acting teacher, singing teacher. Oh um, uh, and that's the teaching thing that she does so well. So I can tell you it's not golf. <laughs> I've started Patrick and my son are both wicked good golfers. So I, I, I thought, all right, I better, you know, try to, oh no, oh no, no, no. It's a stupid game. I'm here to tell you. Oh, yeah. But she's at, she's going to keep at it though. I'm going to the... keep going for the shoes are cute. So I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. And you... Patrick's sister gave me, bequeathed me <laughs> her, her golf clubs. And I, after my first life, it was like, I thought Joanne liked me. It was like, no, she didn't. Like, <laughs> well, you know what the hottest thing now is pickleball. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's playing pickleball. Yeah. I know it's ridiculous. It's still uh, too fast moving for me. Who are you talking to? <laughs> this is foot. old spoke, old folk. The, she, she, <laughs> she broke her foot. That, no, her of, she pulled her tendon. That yeah, pulled her tendon like an Achilles are, tendon or yeah, something. Yeah, that it, oh, it's boy. a sport that has an incredible, you know, number of people who do that to themselves. So I don't know that it's going to be yeah, because the the people that are now doing pickleball are in more advanced age than teenagers. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. And and the problem is you're still bouncing around a tennis court. Mm -hmm. And if your body is not used to doing that, you can do some serious muscle damage and stuff. You're not going to you know fall down and break your arm maybe, but little tendons and things. More power to the people that do it. I don't Absolutely. think we'll be at the sidelines cheering you on. <laughs> I'm lining up a putt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're also going to be headed to Florida and taking on uh, Mame. Yes, it's very, yeah, very I'm exciting. exciting. Yeah, we'll have a twenty. It's just it's a staged reading, so it's not a full production. But we're doing it at one of the Fox theaters, one of those gorgeous old, beautiful buildings, and a twenty-six piece orchestra. So yeah, I'm I'm very I'm I'm jazzed about doing. It. Of course, I'm in total denial that I'm I'm old enough to play the role. Now I'm long in the tooth to play the role is, is, is the truth of it. But I saw Angela Lansbury do uh, Mame. Oh goodness. In, in yeah. the 60s, I think. So, mm -hmm. and it was left an indelible impression. It's a wonderful, fun, yeah. just yummy musical. So I'm very grateful for that. And, uh, of that course movie. the movie with Lucio Ball and we had Lucy Arnaz on several times and we talked oh, about nice. She's wonderful. And we talked about that with Lucio Ball. And uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, definitely an iconic role to yes, to be involved in, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yep. I'm, I'm looking forward to the challenge. Are there other things that you have uh, on that list of things that you would like to do and other challenges that you would like to to meet? You You, you both seem like people who, when there's something in front of you, you know, you meet the challenge and you take it on and you forge through and make the, the most of it. Oh, thank you. I, nothing, there are a couple of other shows I would, I would love to do. There are a couple of other countries I would love to get to. I, so those are <clears throat> on my list, but I, I mean, mm. I'd like, you know, maybe one day I'll ski better. I doubt it, but I'll, you know, like that challenge. I, oh, I know there. Um, so Colorado has 53, what they call 14ers. They're peaks that are oh, just slightly over 14,000 feet. At some point I thought I'm going to do all 53. Well, that's not going to happen, but I've done 12 or 13, yeah. I, something like that. I did one last summer. So I'd like to knock off a couple more 14ers. That would be, that, that would be nice. 
I have no physical aspirations whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> even in since even in Cincinnati. <laughs> even in Cincinnati. I mean, well, I'm going to walk next door to the pub if that yeah. counts. That'll work for me. We're working on our Spanish. We are, yes, and sometimes we'll do an all Spanish day, which which means it's it's pretty monosyllabic. But yeah, in, in terms of challenges of work, mm -hmm. I've never gone after a challenge, but I love it when when somebody counter casts me and then it's a challenge to do that i don't seek it out but it's when it's when it's you know when it's no longer superhero bobby ewing which you know at my age it's not superhero bobby ewing anymore but i'm still the the sort of do good grandfather but every once in a while somebody will do you want to do this role and if i look at it and it's something i've never done before that's the challenge but i i don't go out seeking it um, we just got to do one of those. A friend of ours said, I'm doing this, you know, come on, jump in. So we did. And we both played uh, characters that we would not have been cast for. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah right. I mean, true. it was, it was a romp. It was hysterical. Yeah. It was great fun. Yeah. Great fun. But well, you're only asked to do it because it's a friend who says, uh, mm -hmm. listen, I need some help. Would you guys, <laughs> uh, but a casting director on a regular movie wouldn't, wouldn't think of us. Mm -mm. Oh, that's the person that should play that mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. No, it's. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'm Irish on my dad's side. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Duffy, did you enjoy your St. Patrick's Day? Mm -hmm. I did. Uh, this was this was a wonderful one because of my TV children all taking me out to dinner and doing all of that. And the fans that I met on this celebrity thing were all very gracious about St. Patrick's Day and my birthday. A year ago, this birthday, uh, I was gifted with being the Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin, Ireland. And that was a I celebration. Remember that, yes. What an yeah. honor, huh? Remarkable. It was just remarkable. So uh, it's one of the benefits of being born on a such a festive holiday of St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that I'm Irish on both sides of my family, um, you know, it just, uh, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. I'm more than happy to unwrap it every year. You know, you mentioned step by step, um, uh, any fond remembrances of Suzanne Summers? Oh. All fond mm. remembrances. Yeah. Fond. All fond. Um, you know, I, I finished Dallas in, in 1991. And seven days later, I, I walked literally, because it was on the same soundstage, the uh, same movie studio. I, I walked next door into the offices of Miller Boyette to meet Suzanne Summers for the first time to do Step by Step. And she became, on the very first day, my Larry Hagman. Mm. I had worked with my best friend for all those years. I thought I'll never get that opportunity again. I walked in the door. I met Suzanne. I went, you're my new Larry. And she was. And, you know, she, she referred to me. Linda and I went over to their house about a year ago now, I mm. guess it was. And and Suzanne said, oh, it's my other husband. She always <laughs> referred to me as her other husband. Mm. Um, and she was my other wife. She was, she was as close to me uh, as Larry ever was. Uh, I loved her to death. Um, she had no faults in my eyes, and um, it was one of the uh, one of the best seven years, and then twenty years after that of being friends. Very beautifully said. Yeah, very special person, and with such energy and passion and vim and vigor, mm -hmm. uh, and thirst for life. Right. Oh, humor too. I mean, she was. Oh, yeah. He was just incredible. Uh, it's so funny. She and Alan are the perfect relationship because he's he's this business guy and. Suzanne always said, she said, I'm Alan's suitcase full of ties. Mm -hmm. It's like he, he comes into town, opens a suitcase, and here's what I've got to sell, and out pops Suzanne Summers, you know, mm -hmm. and created an empire. Yeah. They literally created an empire. And it was always the funnest, joyfulest reports that she would give about mm -hmm. what they were doing. Never business, business, business. It was all, can you believe this? This is so much fun. Boom. And and she enjoyed every single minute of it because she interacted with the buyers. It was all, mm. you know, online, uh, you know, television promotion stuff. She got to know all these people. She, They would call her up and go, Suzanne, this is Emily. She'd go, oh, Emily, how's your foot? Is it better now? And she would remember all these people and mm. interact with them all the time. It was just an indication of the depth of her humanity, which was f fathomless, actually. Absolutely. Um, wonderful woman died way too soon way it's too that, it's that damn cancer yes absolutely right yep. uh, 
Linda, of course, you've uh, had an opportunity to work with so many extraordinary people over the years, television and movies, and uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, and uh, working with Henry Winkler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that whole uh, Happy Days gang. What was that like for you? Well, it was Happy Days is the best. The title sums it up in the very uh, best yeah. possible way. I mean, they're lifelong friendships that have developed out of that. Henry, Marion, Kathy, Donnie Most is one of my dearest friends. Oh, yes. So yeah, it was uh, it was a very special time made, brought about by special people, Jerry Paris, who directed most of them, and then Gary Marshall, who was the genius behind it all. We had Marion Ross on the show and, and, and Anson yeah. Williams and his wife, Sharon, were on just a couple of weeks ago. And oh, nice. Yeah. John Most. And Marion, she's a hoot. And, and her son, Jim Meskerman, the incredible oh, yes. impressionist. Yeah. He's yeah. extraordinary. Uh, beautiful people, you know, yes. it's really right. warm. And Don is so uh, yeah. talented as a performer as well mm -hmm. as a singer. That's right. He really right. is extraordinary, huh? Yeah. yeah, lovely, lovely guy. We get to sing together sometimes. And yes. Very yeah, lovely. I mean, you, you don't know when you're that little or young anyway, sort of in in your work together that the, that you're actually planting seeds that are going to come to a whole richer deeper kind of fruition at this stage of life it's a, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful wonderful weave jim will you excuse us i think we're going to have to oh no, you've got to yeah you got to <laughs> make you got to make a sandwich oh, we, got <laughs> it, we just want to uh show again the graphic for oh, yeah. this coming up and what could people expect? You love, I know you love performing at Birdland. I know it's, mm -hmm. I've been there many times myself. It's such an iconic and fabulous place, isn't it, Linda? Yes, it is. I mean, you feel the history of that room and, and the, the, the patina of all of the people who have come before you and who continue to perform there. Um, Jim, as you mentioned, Jim Crusoe and, and Gianni, they just, the energy that they pour into that, the dedication, the, the life force. So that's very invigorating. This Diva Jazz Orchestra is, they are, you know, it's a big band jazz orchestra. There are a few things that, that will make your hair stand on end like they do. They have a robust, dynamic, thrilling sound. And you just, you, you come out of, and you know, listening to them, uh, certainly performing with them, it, you just are alive and invigorated. And you just feel like you can conquer most anything. So I think it'll be an, an energetic, hopefully an entertaining is, uh, show. I just talked to Sherry this morning and we were saying, can't wait till we, till we get to get to, you know, be together again at Birdland. I'll fill in the part that she's always reticent to do. Uh, besides this band and Mr. Ted Firth, mm -hmm. there's going to be Linda Pearl. She'll actually be singing there. Oh. And she sings in different ways. Uh, when she sings with just Ted, sometimes it's piano and Linda. Sometimes it's piano, bass, drums and Linda. When she sings with this type of an orchestra, the performance comes up to the orchestra mm -hmm. and it becomes a whole separate kind of dynamic that people, you know, they're going to love the music. They're going to love everything. But the music is one thing and the interpretation of the music by virtue of her performance is a can't miss situation. <laughs> I mean, it truly is. A, you know, I don't go to all the shows all the time because of scheduling everything. I'm flying from LA to New York just to see Linda sing with the diva band, the orchestra. It's, it's a remarkable once in a lifetime thing. If you're going to do it once, make sure it's with Linda Pearl. <laughs> Make sure you're there. Absolutely. And we'll mention again how folks can get tickets and all really, really nice. And I want to encourage folks to check this out too. I love that you do this blue pearl dot blog, your blog. That's really cool. And for folks watching, you are a brilliant artist as well. Oh, oh, I do. Yeah. No. I do. I, it's very therapeutic. It's hugely yeah. therapeutic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The blog, I encourage folks to check that blog out. Thank She's you. really good, isn't she, uh, Patrick? She's she very is. Talented. You know, I look at the paper. It's white when I look at it. It's white when I leave it. So, <laughs> uh, but she's the writer. She's yeah. the producer. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Multi you guys truly are the very best. I really admire and respect you both. You've always been such extraordinary people that a lot of people 
gravitate to, you, you have a thirst for life, you're genuine, you're authentic, you're real, you're fun. And I really appreciate all the time that you've given, the warmth of the conversation, which is what we do here when I started this series during the pandemic. It was to bring back the lower sort of conversation like Cavett and Carson and Merv and Mike, not interviews, but good conversations. And I just really am blessed that the two of you took the time while you're busy traveling to stop by the show. And I wish Linda, you knock it out of the park there in the city. Patrick, thank you for stopping by as well. And uh, just a blessing to have the two of you here, you two lovebirds. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, you very much, Jim. You get yeah. back in the ocean now. Yeah. I will get back in the you ocean for sure. Okay. <laughs> cool. I hope uh, we'll keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime, my friends. Thank and you. I hope you much. enjoyed the time with me as much as I thank absolutely you. have with you. Indeed. Thank you. You're a master at your craft, Jim. I appreciate that. Thanks for all the time. You be well. Take care, guys. Bye, Bye for now. Bye bye now. Linda Pearl, Patrick Duffy stopping by as well. And I want to show you the opportunities to get tickets to Linda's incredible concert coming up in New York. It's going to be great. Now, if you're watching this six months from now, this is old news. Just go to lindapearl.com to check out some of the other incredible things that she's always doing. Uh, there it is, Linda Pearl and Diva Jazz Orchestra. It's going to happen at Birdland in New York City. It's going to be fantastic. Music director Ted Firth, special guest Nicholas King. He was a guest on our show as well. You can see that episode archived on our YouTube channel and uh, all the episodes with all these great guests that we have. Really, really fantastic. We thank Linda Pearl for stopping by the show and the very special bonus of incredible actor, Patrick Duffy. And if you didn't know, Linda Pearl and Patrick Duffy are a couple and they are together. And you can see the real admiration and the love and the affection that they have for one another. And it was such a nice surprise and delight to have Patrick with us talking about his career and his background and some of his passions. And of course, working on Step by Step and on Dallas and other cool things that he's had an opportunity to be a part of. Really, really special to chat with Patrick Duffy and Linda. There's the album. This could be the start. Check that out. You can go to Amazon and everywhere. You know, we get your music, Spotify, iTunes, download and enjoy. And uh, here's some, we showed some of these earlier in the intro. Linda, Pearl and Patrick Duffy. They've been a part of our lives for a long time. Linda has been performing since she was a kid, really consummate actress, singer, entertainer, beautiful person inside and out, funny, warm, giving, and Patrick Duffy as well. He's a class act, really an extraordinary talent, a nice guy, and it, just the love that the two have. And this was... Uh, his 75th birthday. And you can see the love right there. And he's enjoying his cake on his birthday. Patrick Duffy, Linda Pearl here on the Jim Masters Show, Entertainment Lifestyle, Celebrity Talk Show Series. If you enjoyed this episode, thank you very much for watching. We really appreciate you doing uh, the viewing and enjoying. And uh, that's really very special and kind of you. And we thank again, Linda Pearl and the wonderful Patrick Duffy joining us as well. Great conversation, wasn't it? Talked about a lot of different things, talked about the shows coming up and also a little bit about their career and all the other cool things that um, Linda's involved in and Patrick as well. And uh, the wonderful loving romance that the two of them have, which I think is really something very inspiring, something beautiful and something quite special. Wow. This was a special episode and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, we thank them so much for the time they gave us. They're actually in Cincinnati in a hotel right now as they're traveling. 
that's where they were coming from. And again, they're going to be, you know, Linda's going all over the place. She's going to Florida. She's going to Japan. She's going to St. Louis. She's got a lot going on. And if you have not had a chance to see her perform, get tickets to her shows, whether it's this show in New York or anytime you have an opportunity to see Linda Pearl uh, maybe you know her from her years on television and film and some of your favorite movies and TV shows. But if you didn't know that she's a spectacular entertainer and singer and tells wonderful stories during her performances and cabaret and so much more, make sure you get you get a chance to see her because she will knock your socks off. She really, she's uh, really a fabulous talent on many different levels. And again, she's surrounded by a lot of incredible people for the upcoming performance in New York City, which is going to be really something extra special. Really great, gang. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Jim Masters Show. We always work hard to put some special things together for you. If you did enjoy it, give this episode a like. There's a thumbs up like button on the YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. Give it a like, share this episode on your social media, leave a comment for us underneath the episode, uh, interact with us. What did you enjoy about having Linda Pearl and Patrick Duffy as my guests here today on the show? And uh, make sure that uh, you also subscribe to the channel, Jim Masters TV on YouTube. We would absolutely love that. This was really spectacular. Good times, great conversation with Linda Pearl and Patrick Duffy, uh, which was very, very nice. And um, we thank them both for the time. And we thank you for watching, supporting, and sharing, and celebrating what we're doing here, bringing back the Laura Soda Conversation on the Jim Masters Show. With that said, I am your host, Jim Masters. Thanks for being with us. I thank you for your time this time till next time. Come see us again. As I said to Linda and Patrick, we'll keep the porch light on for them. They're welcome back anytime. And you're welcome back anytime to join us here. Don't forget, you can binge watch all the episodes. If you'd like to see this episode again, it's on our YouTube channel. You can watch on demand uh, hundreds and hundreds of episodes with incredible guests, celebrity friends and special guests who stop by the Gym Masters show to share their experiences, to share their time with us. And I am very honored by that. I'm honored that you watch and enjoy as often as you do. Don't keep it a secret. Tell your friends and family and colleagues and associates about our series. We're doing something special here. And with you here, it's extra special. Take care of one another, love one another, and don't forget to take time for yourself and love yourself as well. For all of us, I'm Jim Masters. We'll see you on the next episode. Love having you here. Be well and cheers. <laughs>